So, hello everybody. It's time for your favourite podcast. Or, well, I've been presumptuous there. Maybe one of your favourite podcasts. Presumably you like listening to this because you're listening to it right now. Um, but I don't want to, we don't want to blow our own trumpets. Um, not too much anyway. We're awesome. Um, anyway, uh, it's it's time for the Linux Voice podcast. It's series four, episode six, and I'm Andrew Gregory. I'm Ben Everard. I'm Graham Morrison. And I'm Mike Saunders. And in this fun-packed um, casting of, of sound waves, we've got uh, we've got news. We've got a halfway reminder, which will probably come in at about the three quarter of the way through mark. We've got finds of the fortnight. Uh, we have neurons to read out, perhaps. Uh, and we have uh, a voice of the masses. The exciting thing about the vocalize your neuron section is that because Mike's in Germany, the internet takes him, takes slightly longer for it to get to him. And I can't tell whether he, he, might, he could have nodded or shook his head or anything. It's just a blur of, of uh, <laughs> Bratwurst and tax leaks that are clouding the, the ether. I can almost see the uh, Süddeutsche Zeitung officers from where I live, so um, when Putin blows them up, I'll probably get killed in the fallout. <laughs> well, I was going to say, it looks like a time warp as well to Germany, because it looks like Mike sat in like Eastern Berlin in like 1956 yeah. or something. <laughs> Monit- <laughs> monitoring his neighbours. <laughs> e them what days. <sighs> of course, if you like the sound of this, but... Um, Without the despotic communist regimes, uh, you can subscribe to our magazine, which at shop.linuxvoice.com. It's um, an A4 magazine made out of paper, or if you prefer PDFs or EPUBs. And of course, those EPUBs and PDFs have no DRM in them because we don't like it. Right, it's time for the news. The first, the first news story this this fortnight may initially seem like an April Fool's joke. But, but it's not. Ubuntu Ubuntu is running on Windows. We have the first GNU slash Windows system up and uh, up and trotting along. This is due to the work uh, between Microsoft and Canonical have created kind of like the anti version of Wine. Some some libraries and gubbinses and whatnot that allows uh, Linux binaries to run on Windows. So this, this isn't even Ubuntu being recompiled to run on Windows. This is the actual exact same binaries that uh, ship in the regular Linux version uh, will now run on top of Windows 10, uh, provided you've got the, the stuff installed. Um, so when we say Ubuntu, we're not talking about just anything from the repositories. Uh, it's mostly focused around the command line software, so bash runs and a load of, yeah, you can use all your usual uh, uh, command line tool sets, and uh, they will run. Everyone here is uh, looking at me in a stunned silence. Well, that I mean, seems quite cool. Often with the first news story, I go, this is huge news, but this is huge news for all kinds of reasons. It's, I mean, this you could kind of... I suppose the difference between this and SIGWIN, which I think was like POSIX compliant for Windows, was that every, the binaries had to be compiled against the, the SIGWIN binaries. Um, SIGWIN let you run lots of like Unix-like tools on Windows um, and get bash up. And this, but this isn't like that, is it? No, no. This is um, this is them running natively on Windows. Um, is there like a kernel interpreter in there? Well, it's much like uh, in Wine, really, because ultimately you're running on the same hardware. So x86 machine code is x86 yeah. machine code. It doesn't really matter where it's running or what OS is. But then, yeah, so Linux uh, binaries call cool stuff from the kernel, and all it is is a load of... Um, remapping. Yeah, remapping so that Windows understands the uh, the calls to the Linux kernel and does things appropriately. I, I think it's uh, very cool. I know that it created all kinds of debate about uh, Canonical selling out to Microsoft and it diminishes and it gives few people fewer reasons to move to open source. But um, I think, you know, it's kind of the death knell for uh, PowerShell, which was coming up to be a pretty powerful kind of command prompt on Windows. And it'll get more people kind of over that, what they many see as like a speed hump to Linux adoption, which is the scariness of the console, and realize just how powerful things like apt-get install is uh, for for getting all the utilities. They'll basically, I think, find themselves using Linux all the time inside Windows and then get to a point and think, well, why am I using Windows? Yeah, I mean, as far as I can tell, this is primarily targeted at sysadmins. 
Um, so it's, yeah, it's for that sort of people are doing shuffling stuff around and looking through files and doing all that sort of jazz, which the Linux command line is phenomenally good at. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. It's, I've never agreed with that argument that providing more free software on Windows puts people off moving to Linux. Um, it's, it just doesn't seem to make much much sense logically to me. And even even if people were using Linux and using you know free software and just not thinking about moving to Linux, so what? Linux is just the kernel. If you're using free software, you're using free software and you're winning. Yeah, I agree. So I mean. From also from a Microsoft perspective, it is it's another significant um, embracing of uh, something that you know they used to see as a, a, a competitor that's destructive. Um, and I think another indication that uh, the management I know that there are still bad things happening, and Microsoft, just like every other big corporation, is multifaceted, and there are other areas where it's actually being quite combative. But I think, in general, the main thrust of the new management regime, you know, by an ex, basically an ex-Sun employee, um, is is one of increasing openness to um, other ways of doing things, and that's a good thing. Indeed. It's... Uh... I was a bit conflicted as well because part of me feels like, oh, these are our tools. We should keep them for, for Linux. Windows shouldn't be able to, uh, to benefit. But actually, that's that's not a particularly healthy way of looking at it. It's um, yeah, Andrew. I completely agree with Andrew. The more people using free software, the better. And even if they're not using completely free software, it does take people uh, a step closer to it. Because I doubt many people who are currently using Linux are going to go, well, now I can use uh, Bash on Windows. I have no reason to use Linux anymore. Yeah. And there's no X, importantly, I guess, or graphical layer. No, um, but this also, yeah, we don't know how far it's going to go. There could well be a graphical layer in the future. Um, yeah. Do, do, can you maybe. use it now? I'm sorry I haven't looked. Is it something that you can use now? I don't have a Windows 10 machine, or, so I didn't even look into that. No, I but think, I mean, is it available? So. I, I think it's just been Google. demonstrated. I don't think it's been released. Um, all right, let's uh, let's move on to our next item of news. This is uh, this is Debian. I've got into a bit of a spat with the developer of X Screensaver, and basically this comes down to um, Debian's model of releasing software and how much. Uh, control should the developer have over this? Uh, they release as the, the Debian release cycle sort of goes through testing, unstable, and stable. And the stable release uh, contains a lot of really quite old versions of software with any security fixes backported into them. Um, and not all developers are particularly happy with this because uh, when bugs are found, you know, people using your software, they found a bug, they report it to you. Um, and that, if your software is three four years old or even not as old as that those bugs may well have been fixed in more recent versions and you spend your time telling people well you, that bug you've reported i fixed that years ago um and there's nothing i can do to ship that to you if your distribution doesn't do it and the x screen saver developer put in a they put in a warning so if you're running an old piece of code it popped up a warning saying you're running an old piece of code here and <laughs> someone put in a bug to Debian saying there's this old there's this warning there, and Debian were talking about removing it. And the developer popped into the uh, the bug report and said, actually, can you just stop including X Screen Saver in Debian if you're not going to include a recent version? And yes, arguments ensued. Yeah, because a lot of it comes down to. Um, if you make something open source, um, you know, and put it under a BSD or GPL license, you're giving people the freedom to to do a lot with it. You know, how far after the the fact then can you go around and tell people what they should and shouldn't do? Um, of course, the guy behind X Screen Saver is Jamie. I think he's pronounced Sawinski, who used to um, have a lot of involvement at Netscape, and I think maybe early Mozilla days as well. So he's a very well known developer. Um, but yeah, the the uh, it's well worth reading this um, bug discussion on on the Debian site. Uh, it does get a bit flame warry, but it poses a lot of questions like who is responsible. I mean, Debian is responsible for maintaining that software. Debian will 
produce security patches for it. Um, but then should Debian simply remove Jamie's email address to stop him getting bugs? Um, yeah, in, Matthew Gary wrote quite an interesting piece on it in that there's really no difference between a regular bug and a security bug. If you if your application crashes, you can probably exploit that if you try hard enough. It's just that generally we don't, you know, when you find a bug, and unless you happen to be a security researcher, you don't always think of the security implications. It's just, oh, it crashes, find a way of fixing it. And those don't always get backported to security patches unless they're flagged as security bugs. But that's not necessarily, you know, an actual difference in the software. Um, and it's interesting you mentioned that you worked at Mozilla because obviously this is what Firefox did back in the day. And, uh, last podcast or a podcast before we announced that yeah, Debian was switching from Ice Weasel to Firefox, which is Firefox did to avoid exactly this issue. They insisted that Debian change the name so people didn't associate their fi- uh, their software with this out of date uh, Debian version. So what's Debian going to do? Have they come to any kind of conclusion? Uh, when I looked through it the other day, they hadn't yet reached a conclusion, but they seem to be erring on the side of just removing the warning and removing this chap's email address. <laughs> yeah. um, and it, it does, it's an interesting one. Do distros have a moral obligation to follow the wishes of a developer, even if they're not legally obliged to? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think in this case they should. Yeah, it's it's like um, it's like asserting your moral rights to a piece of work, you know, or um, not, you know, being. It's like Johnny Marr saying that uh, David Cameron is not allowed to like the Smiths. You know, he can say that he can be annoyed. <laughs> David Cameron is perfectly allowed to like the Smiths in whatever overseas territory or or indeed the UK he he wants to, but really, morally, he shouldn't. <laughs> that's not true <laughs> but I don't think it's necessarily the case with every piece of software but this isn't a critical piece of software there are replacements that use, people could use and in this case I think they should follow the developers wishes and, um, well I haven't used X screensaver for years but it's, a prin- it's the principle that they've chosen to they've licensed it under the GPL and that's like the beginning and the end of the conversation you know as far as I'm concerned that's it they, of course, the author can ask, and the author yeah. can, you know, s- send back people to the Debian mailing lists when people complain about bugs. But you know, if if the Debian community decides that it's more useful for them to keep their packages of X Screen Saver in because lots of people use it, then that's up to them. And if if David Cameron wants to like the Smiths, who who cares? <laughs> I think Andrew cares. Yeah, <laughs> Johnny Marr cares, and if Johnny Marr cares, then I care. Oh, but you've got you can't Johnny Marr. You can't. I mean, electronic. What was that? That's great. <laughs> uh, getting away with it is a great tune. <laughs> oh, no, no, it's a very good life. You're not allowed to like electronic. <laughs> <laughs> is David Cameron allowed to like electronic? He can like electronic. Yeah, I'm sure. I he's think he can like electronic. Yeah. yeah, he like he likes West End girls. No opportunities. That should be the Pet Shop Boys song for him. <laughs> Right, <laughs> moving moving away from the Smiths and uh, our political overlords, uh, Ubuntu have uh, have announced the pre order of their tablet, uh, which is uh, their first convergence device, uh, and this is the fabled, long fabled convergence, <laughs> the, the long fabled ability to plug in a mobile device into a uh, into a monitor and keyboard and mouse and whatnot and have it magically switch from a mobile interface to a regular desktop interface um this has been uh, talked about for years and uh, never quite come and we're now told it's ever so slightly closer to actually becoming a reality do we know if it comes with a nice little docking station to connect to your monitor and stuff or do you just have to have a big cable spaghetti going on I don't I think it comes with anything. Cable spaghetti. Yeah, I don't even think it comes with a mouse or keyboard, does it? It's just the standard BQ tablet that you uh, can buy. Yeah. Um. So yeah, it doesn't so even co- become a convergence device until you um, add other things to it. Yeah. I mean, um, and I guess the big question about this is: Does anyone care about convergence anymore? Um. I think I. I, I don't. Yeah. I don't. 
Andrew doesn't. Uh, I think I if if it becomes not convergence and you know perhaps if like um like the Win Microsoft Surface, which is kind of becoming quite popular, they bundled it as an ultra thin laptop um, that works as a tablet when you don't turn the keyboard on, and it works as a desktop when you've got the Bluetooth turned on on the super thin keyboard case. Then I think I get that. I think the fact that I turn the keyboard on and the the screen turns into a regular Ubuntu desktop, I find quite exciting. I think that's quite neat because I, I've I've tried doing like proper work with Android and uh, tablets, and I basically want a window manager. Um, and Android hasn't got the window management. Cyanogen so mods kind of playing with split screens as is iOS. And I think in in some ways, Canonical is a bit ahead of the curve in being able to provi- provide that now. Um, and convergence might kind of muddy the waters over the advantages of that. Um, you know, if it was like an Ubuntu surface, then I think that's cooler than a convergence device. Well, the fundamental difference between this tablet and the Windows Jobby is that the Windows Jobby, it changes the window manager, but the software is still the same. You can only run mobile apps. <clears throat> Whereas with this tablet, you'll be able to run, yeah. in principle, the full uh, Ubuntu repositories. Um yeah, you can. I mean, they cool. show they show it running LibreOffice and GIMP, and you can install app, get install stuff. Yeah. Um, so Sorry. I think it's pretty cool. I think the BQ device isn't perhaps powerful enough. Um, spe- the spec of the there's like a, a low level and an HQ level, and it's quite pricey as well. Um, so yeah, I'd like to have seen a powerful device bundled with an ultra thin keyboard case. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, it's one of those things. I think it's quite interesting, but I don't think I have any use for it, personally. Um, right, let's, uh, let's move on to our next piece of news this fortnight. Linux is now on the PS4, the PlayStation 4 console. <clears throat> it's, uh, you can, it's all on GitHub, available to, uh, to download if you have a PS4. Excellent. Super cheap supercomputers, ahoy. <laughs> Does it still well, use that, H- that old funky is it cell processor architecture? No, it's all x86 now. Yeah, they dropped that after the PS3, I think. Yeah. And they dropped the, Sony dropped the Linux support, the official Linux support on the PS3. This requires an ancient version of the PS4 firmware. So basically, um, nobody nobody who uses their <laughs> PS4 um, or at least uses it online for anything, which must be nearly everyone, can install this. And as much as I understand it, the exploit, which is probably through the WebKit um, browser, is um, obfuscated so that it's not taken down from GitHub. So you kind of have to work that out for yourself as well if you happen to have version 1.7 of the kernel. And then you get run Linux running on what's basically, you know, a reasonable 200, 300 pounds PC. Great for yeah, Cody. You say, <laughs> you say no one who regularly uses their PS3, uh, PS4 can do this, but anyone who regularly uses their PS4 won't want to do this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it's cool. It's a cool hack. Um, if it could be made to work with modern firmwares, which it never will because it will just be a cat and mouse game with Sony, then I'd install it. Um, but otherwise, I'd just get a, a you know a, a mini PC to put under my television. I'd, it's yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, could this convert a PS4 into a Steam box? Um, yes, it it, bet- it could in theory. The the graphics card slightly modified um, AMD. Um, graphics card um but also this uh, this hardware is like two three years old um you could build a much better steam box um so it probably wouldn't it wouldn't play games on the steam box as well as it played games on the ps4 for example because developers spend a lot of time de- optimizing for exactly the spec of the ps4 which is why they look so good on on hardware that's comparatively old um, so you, yeah. you still wouldn't really want to do that unless you could perhaps do it <laughs> dual boot side by side with the PS4. Yeah. Um, okay. But it's still, yeah, ma- interesting project. <laughs> interesting is like the most depressing thing to say, <laughs> isn't it? It'll be interesting <laughs> to see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> interesting. You're using interesting here in the same way I used it on the uh, Convergence tablet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
I like, I'm very interested in the, the kind of world of exploits and how people manage to find small little bugs in WebKit and turn this into a, a, a way of taking over the whole system as a, as a, you know, as a, as a, a thing to do. It's fascinating and it's really good looking into it and the fact that they can build a working Linux system out of it. But yeah, the fun is in getting that to happen rather than using the final product. Did, uh, did just speaking of exploits in video games did anyone see the video that was out uh, last week or the week before about the guy playing super mario world uh and just entirely by hand converted it into flappy birds using various exploits <sighs> no so and this did has he been actually done... do it purely oh gone. Yeah, it was 100% by hand. So this has been done many times by sort of various things. There's a, a quite a famous robot that plays and can do it. You can plug in, you know, you can do it on emulators where you can just sort of script the input that goes in um, to trigger the particular exploits. But in this case, he did it entirely by hand. So, yeah, just using uh, using his fingers to tap away at the, uh, at the buttons. And, uh, yeah, there's a complete video of him doing it, and it took him... Took him a failed while, a few hours. but um, And you can see it all sort of going through. So as he does certain things, the screen changes colour and bits disappear. And it's things like he used... Um, he, the first One of the first exploits he did uh, changed the coin counter to display, I think, uh, the X buffer so you could see how far across he was moving because he needed to get that precisely right to trigger other exploits and things like that. And uh, yeah, he goes through a whole load of them amazing they're, they're obviously clever they're obviously computationally clever and that's what they spend their time on yeah yeah because he has to trigger about I think, three or four exploits to get all this before he can then start entering the machine code by hand and uh, yeah and then has to do yeah then you know, change the pointer to point to the start of the new stuff and it's it's really mad the stuff he goes to but it's really interesting as well <laughs> Interesting in that a pointless way. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it all? Yeah. May, okay, maybe, yeah. <laughs> this will be the Nilis podcast. Yeah. Um, and uh, our final news story this fortnight is uh, WhatsApp have turned on end-to-end -end encryption for everything, for voice chats, for text, for... I can't even remember what they do now. Uh, group chats for, for all the things. Uh, I mean, this started a couple of years ago in 2014 um, when they started turning on some end-to-end -end encryption for some, uh, in some cases, and it sort of gradually got further and further down the road. And now, provided you and everyone you're talking with has the latest version of WhatsApp, you will have full end-to-end -end encryption that um, even WhatsApp and Facebook can't poke their little noses into. So this this helps. the. It's bad because this helps terrorists but it's good because it will protect people when they when they're dealing with panamanian shell companies yeah <laughs> yes yeah good law abiding i don't know what to think anymore <laughs> yeah good law abiding panamanian uh, uh yeah shell companies can communicate securely good i mean that's uh, what business is about isn't it yeah yeah, I and mean, this has been done by by Whisper Systems, who are sort of pretty well known in the crypto world for doing things properly. And um, as far as we can tell, it seems to be completely what they say it is. Um, obviously, with closed source software, you can never be a hundred percent sure of that. But could this um, be the end of things like TLS and SSL? Because the protocol they've implemented is um, completely different, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it's, they use noise pipes, which I, I don't fully understand, but create a sort of encrypted tunnel to push data down. Um, as far as I'm aware, it's kind of like a, uh, a just a more modern version of SSL. Um, you know, it sounds very uh, cool. It's, they, yeah, they call it's, it it's a better like... name. Yeah, and this is it's quite similar to the stuff that Whisper Systems use on their own encrypted apps. Uh, Signal, I think they call it. Um, Yes, yeah, yeah. In fact, they've changed the name, haven't they? Yeah, to Signal. Yeah, from Axolotl to Signal. I know, which that's a pity, I think. But uh... yeah, so yeah, this is certainly interesting news coming in the wake of the iPhone FBI spat. Um, it appears, at least, to be quite a big two fingers up to the establishment, really. Um, so, 
we'll see how uh, in principle yeah, this could fall foul of the the snoopers charter should it be passed yeah. and and other laws everyone have to go back to using sms please yes <laughs> an irc <laughs> <clears throat> um and uh that's all the news we have this fortnight excellent so it's now time for finds of the fortnight uh so I asked the, the IRC channel. Um, there's been a few discoveries, um, finds. So uh, first one from Still Void, uh, love2d.org. No idea what that is. I'm just clicking on it now. Uh, love, free 2D game engine, okay? Open source. Um, it looks nice. Um, nice website. It looks uh, lots of game code examples on there. Um, it looks easy, straightforward. Um, looks like it's something worth looking into. Um Silverwood says, uh, I've also discovered Let's Encrypt is very good, but that's hardly news. Um, is Let's Encrypt still good, Ben? Yeah, it's just uh, the slightly awkward bit about turning your web server off and on again. Um, and the Python 2.7 but... requirement? Yeah. Um, as far as I'm aware, those are still requirements, but I haven't actually... We, I, I can't remember when I renewed us to... It was a couple of months ago now. Um, I need to do my own site. They keep saying that. I haven't done it yet. Um, Devilment says he's been using the new Delta RPMs for updates and it's saving him loads of bandwidth. Um, I guess that's on Fedora. That's a really neat idea. So you only get the differences between one RPM and the next. Um, uh, Still Voice says, I discovered Docker-Compose V2, which has some nifty new features over V1. I have no idea what that is, um, but I'll leave that there. Enom, um, so this is something I saw on Reddit. Studio Ghibli, who make all those awesome uh, films that kids love and that are slightly surreal, um, they have open-sourced a big piece of their software they used for many of their films, um, Open Tunes. Um, as I don't think there's a Linux build yet because it was for Windows and OS X, but there's a lot of people working on the Linux build, so it will help you create, um, you know, the kind of uh, cartoon animation that Studio Ghibli is famous for. Yeah, they use it in Futurama, don't they? Yeah. Do they? They use the same software? I think so. Um, that would be awesome, having something like that on Linux. Uh, I really, I, I, From what I've read, I haven't read for the, a week or so, but on Reddit uh, the developers were saying that there's lots of it shouldn't be that difficult. There's a few things they need to re-implement, a few bits they need to grab from elsewhere, but um, it should be perfectly feasible. Um, mm. Enom also says his three-year-old daughter loves spotting all the penguins in the competition of issue of Linux Voice, and can we have more hidden penguins, please? Uh, she's been disappointed by the lack of penguins in the issue since. I think we should hide <laughs> some penguins. I think we should hide some penguins. Um, and then McPhail says, I'm not tech-related, but I discovered this chap... Um, I have to click on a link now to see it. It's a picture of uh, what looks like a black Labrador puppy. Um, I don't know if he means he has discovered it and taken um, taken them into his house. Um, anyway, they're the finds from, uh, finishing rather randomly, they're the finds from the IRC channel. Um, that, I'll, talk of the penguins, that just reminded me, I think uh, at Bristol Zoo there's a, ping, a penguin named Linus. Oh, uh, cool. I think I'm remembering that correctly. I have to go and see if we can get a picture that, of him. That from the does ring a bell. Go and interview him. <laughs> <laughs> I was um, about to do an impression of that interview and I've no idea what sound a penguin <laughs> is. <laughs> um, anyone else want to have a go? Yeah, but Enom has stolen my find. Really? The oh. Studio Ghibli thing? Yeah. I can add that it's under the new BSD license. Um, oh, that's, do you know that's if there's a it. Linux? Is there a Linux version yet? I I, I do not know. This. Be, yeah. I could all, I, all I know is everything that has been said, plus that one thing that I added. And I haven't watched the Studio Ghibli films for quite some time, but um, I went through a phase like everybody did watching them. They are they are, they really get under your skin. They stay with you. They're like mad dreams. Yeah. What, what like films Mirror are they? Um, well, Spirited Away, Howl's Moving Castle. Um, they're, like ch they, they, they're kind of children's films, um, usually involving children discovering abandoned places um, that are haunted by old river gods and such things. Um, yeah, I don't know. They're like, they're like nursery, nursery tales. 
but told, yeah, like Grimm's fairy tales, but in a, with a, from maybe from a Japanese perspective. Okay. Hmm. Um. Yeah. Shall I? Uh, shall I go with my discovery? Yeah. Kind thing. Um, I've been playing with Open Bazaar, which is a it's a new decentralized peer to peer shopping system. Huh. Um, and it's sort of. It came out after the FBI took down Silk Road, uh, but it's not. It's not in the s- <laughs> right. So yeah, so Silk Road. I is can't a hear what you're saying. Sorry, Ben. The line's a lot gone of dead. Dodgy th- things. <laughs> this. This it's not specifically for dodgy things. That's not even really a <laughs> not, particularly good use. Nothing is specifically for dodgy things, is it? <laughs> <laughs> well. I mean, for example, it's not anonymized. It doesn't run over tour or anything like that. So it's, it's genuinely not a good fit, at least at the moment. I don't know if things might change, but it's not a good fit for, for, for selling the sort of stuff that was on Silk Road. Instead, you can sort of see it more as a, a just a decentralized shopping system um, so that you can, at the one point, there are things that are tied to the network. So, for example, reviews and ratings and reputations. They are sort of cryptographically signed and held on the network itself rather than on the individual site. But at the same time, anyone can set up a site and no one can sort of force you to take it down or control what you can and can't sell. So it's kind of like um, you get the advantages of things, places like Amazon where you, other people set up shops, but you can trust the ratings um, and the advantages of individual websites where anyone can spin them up and they can't say, oh, we've got a rule against selling i don't know fresh fruit or something um so yeah you got these these two things and there's no fees on it so you know there's not some global corporation taking fees and not paying tax on them um so it's got this yeah it's quite it's got a nice feel to it at the moment i mean it was only released like two days ago the the first version so there's not a huge amount on it but you can go on and buy t-shirts and you can buy raspberry pies on it Stolen, <laughs> stolen raspberry pies. <laughs> Probably not stolen raspberry pies, um, and stuff like that. I was, I was thinking of setting up a, a Linux voice shop on it, but then I decided against it. I was too busy writing. Um, yeah, it does sound yeah, good. It, yeah, and at the same, you can also set yourself up. There's sort of escrow services on it. They call it moderators, where you know, people resolve disputes and the money, yeah, so the money doesn't go directly to the seller. But there's no centralized escrow service, so anyone can set themselves up to the sort of secondary market for that. And it's just a really open, uh, decentralized shopping site, which it's certainly got a lot of potential. Yeah. At the moment. there's not quite enough, uh, quite enough on it for it to really be that useful. But uh, it's well worth checking out this build. At the moment, it's a bit hard to get it to work on anything other than Debian or Ubuntu um, or on the derivatives. But hopefully that will change. Ah, um, sounds good. I like the idea of some decentralized shopping site. <laughs> yeah. It, it, yeah, definitely sort of when I saw it, I thought, yeah, actually, that could be really useful. Yeah. Haven't said interesting once, so that's a good sign. Any more finds? I can go if you want. Yeah, no, you go for it, Mike. Um, well, the uh, the first find, the Linux-related find, may actually be a refind. I'm not sure if I knew this before, um, but I discovered that at the command line, um, in certain Bash installations, if you put a space before a command, it doesn't store it in your Bash history. Yeah, I think we've had that before, but, but it's maybe- worth reiterating. <laughs> It is worth reiterating because yeah. it's a useful little tip if you're doing something to do with passwords and stuff and you don't yeah. want it stored at all in your history. Um, but my second find, which is less Linux related, but really, really awesome in my humble opinion, um, is, is a piece of hardware from uh, 1987. I really like um, retro hardware because when you look back at devices and gadgets and, and especially video game stuff made at the time, they really pushed the limits of what was possible. If you think of the Game Boy camera, its resolution is abysmal. It, it's it's awful. But back in the in the day, it was so amazing that you could plug that into your Game Boy. I remember plugging it into my um, Super NES via the Game Boy SNES adapter, and then running it through our family's video recorder. So I actually had a, a sort of makeshift video re- uh, camcorder system. Mike, Mike, can I? Which leads me were on. Were you to- the happiest 
in yep. 1987. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, because Frontier hadn't come out then. And the Game Boy Camera didn't come out till 95 anyway, I think. But um, what I um, discovered is the Fisher Price PXL 2000. This is a handheld camcorder that came out in 1987 <laughs> for the price of 125 quid. Now, apparently camcorders around that time were over a thousand. Um, so it's it's a, a handheld thing um, geared towards kids. But what makes it amazing is that it records video onto standard audio cassettes. Wow. Well, I didn't think that was actually possible, but um, well, we've got the link in the podcast notes so listeners can go and look at all the pictures. Um, but it basically, uh, it recorded to a resolution of 120 by 90 pixels um, at 15 frames a second. And then you fed it back through your TV. Apparently the results were blurry and, and ghosty and, and looked quite scary. Um, but just the idea of using standardized cassette That's tapes, amazing. which were yeah. 10 a penny even back then. I've never heard of yeah. it. So it's, it. I mean, you can store digital data on cassette tapes because we use them for games and stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm, well, I'm, yeah, but I mean, it was still audio then, wasn't it? It was the, it, you know, they were boop, beep, beep, they were using audio data in order to encode it's put, yeah, digital yeah, data. But you can use audio data to encode video data. It's just digital data. Yeah, but it's probably not digital, is it? It's probably analog data. It's probably just, you know, um, the mo- modulated RF output from the camera. But just that's true, actually. Yeah, um, just directly on, just as you would with the audio, which was, which is why there's so limited bandwidth on it. But Still, I'm actually looking. I'm just looking at the pictures of it now. It looks amazing. I'm amazing. That's an excellent find. Um, I've I've, I've got a couple of finds really. One of one of them was um. Let me just find it. It was the the last comment from our previous podcast. Um, I read it out. It's by Hugo. He says, um, "I've just listened to your people's voice segment on AI." And I thought I'd have to write to add a few comments, especially related to the economic arguments presented. Do you remember we had a big discussion about um, how little you need to live? And uh, and we had, you know, some people talking about this on Twitter. Anyway, Hugo goes on to say, in particular, the continued full time working we all enjoy and the lack of Keynesian free time or Keynesian free time. Some have some have just suggested that we humans have become productive to the point of not requiring full time employment in comparison to the needs of standard living. However, these advances in productivity are taken from the productivity system as profits for the owners of the industry. Secondly, economic growth is generally related to the number of ac- of acti- of the active population, i.e., those of working age. So, having a fully employed adult population is an important measure of potential. Adding AI units to this population also adds economic growth potential and profits too. I would suggest that just like the steam engine, the production line, the telephone, the computer, the automobile, AI will be consumed by our economy and the associated efficiencies will be realised as more profits. Wow, that's depressing. Let's go back to privacy and encryption. (laughs) (laughs) Um. My, my second kind of loosely linked to the following that is that Amnesty International has said, um, along with the EFF, that uh, they think encryption is a, a human rights issue, um, which I think is a good thing for them to say. Um, and then finally, a small find, it came up on the IRC channel, and I'm sorry, I can't remember who uh, mentioned it, but it's a small command line tool called uh, speed test hyphen CLI. And it basically tests your um, internet connection uh, for ping and upload download speeds. And since I've installed it, I've been using it all the time, mostly because of my really poor BT line here um, at home. Um, I can see what kind of speed I'm getting at different times of day, see whether it's the Wi-Fi or whether it's the actual connection to the internet. Um, but it's a s- really simple tool. I saw s- I saw somewhere, I can't remember where I saw it, uh, someone created a Twitter bot that does that, and every time it drops below a certain level, it tweets your internet provider complaining about it. <laughs> oh, that's cool. That's really good. I might have to set that up. Um, because, yeah, it's, it's so easy to set up with Cron. You can just leave it, and then you can go to your ISP and say, look, you know, what are you guys playing at? Um, um, and they're my finds. <laughs> and they are our finds and your finds. Thank you, everyone. Yep, that brings us hurtling towards the halfway reminder. Still to come, we've got Voice of the Masses and maybe, just maybe, uh, Vocalise Your Neuron. Reminder! 
You can subscribe to Linux Voice at shop.linuxvoice.com. All right, let's hurtle into the vocalize your neuron section and then hurtleize straight out because we don't have anything. Um, so if anybody wants to send me non XML messages to read out, then um, mike at linuxvoice.com. Didn't you get. You get um, contacted by somebody from the television, didn't you, Mike, yesterday? I did, uh, yes. Um, a production company behind a TV program that I won't mention just yet, but they uh, want to use Linux Voice as a prop in a, um, an office of an IT company. So um, we are internationally famous now. This TV program seems to be quite well known in, in the UK and the States. So, yeah, yeah our eagle-eyed readers or listeners or both um, may see it at some point. Excellent. Watch telly. I've actually, uh, it was in June last year, that's right, and I found the email. Um, we had an, a similar email from somebody who was making um, a children's TV show in the UK um, it, it, um, to be broadcast on CBBC in February. So a couple of months ago, um, I didn't look, unfortunately. Um, but if anybody's interested and, and their children want to trawl um, iPlayer <laughs> in the UK, um, the programme, apparently, um, it was Series 2 of EVE for CBBC. Um, and they wanted to use uh, a copy of Linux Voice magazine. I think it might have been the one with the Richard Stallman cover. Um, all that we know is, um, it was, oh, it was issue 11 of Linux Voice. And it, it's the scene is with three teenage characters and they're hanging out in one of the bedrooms and one character is reading the magazine. Um, and we said, yes, fine, go ahead, do that. Um, I've never gone back and looked at Eve, the TV series, um, and seen whether they actually used the next voice or not. So it would be an interesting challenge if you want to set your kids up doing that for the rest of the Easter holidays. Oh, I should I'm have insisted they put us in the credits. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Okay, so I've, I've just gone through the email trail a little bit. It's episode three of Eve, series two. That might be a little easier. Fame at last. I wondered why teenagers started to look at me funny. <laughs> <laughs> Right, that must bring us to Voice of the Masses then. Um, we've we've seen, you know, great leaps forward for for mankind. Uh, not least in the form of free software, where things are just getting better and better all the time. Absolutely, but there are still people, you know, stuck on their their old Windows X, XP. God bless them, or. Vista or whatever machine. So we're just waiting for one killer feature um, before they make the switch to fully free software. So we asked, what are you waiting for? What's, you know, what's, what is it that's holding you back it's from, you know, jumping in with both feet where, you know, everything is free and lovely. Um, I, I, the biggest thing for me, I reckon, is probably the lack of proper CMYK support in the game still um, but that's that's it really uh, nothing there's nothing that I use and even then I, I never have to do it I never do any image editing we pay somebody to do that for us <laughs> <laughs> every, every time I want you know a dog photoshopped onto the surface of the moon or something we, we could just pay someone to do it <laughs> so no there's no reason I didn't see that in, uh, in the recent <laughs> issue <laughs> look out for it that's just in his living room <laughs> Just beg me, just stood on the moon. On, on the canvas there. Yeah. So, what? Uh, what about everybody else? Mike, uh, do you ever use non-free stuff? Uh, occasionally. I mean, there's there's still some games that it'd be good to have um, ported to uh, Linux. I mean, there's nothing really that bothers me. I've been using Linux for pretty much all my daily driver work for the last 15 years. I think the, the thing I would like most is um, a greater um, selection, a, a greater uh, range of options when going to buy new hardware, especially laptops. There are some um, 
uh, vendors that sell laptops with Linux pre-installed. And, you know, there's that Dell XPS, which apparently runs Linux like a charm, but it's still a very small range. It'd be great one day if, if you can just choose any laptop and you can tick a box and it comes with Linux and everything works perfectly. And then you've got a, a huge range of, of thin laptops, durable ones. It's quite limited at the moment. That, that's my only main Beat. Games, yes. Uh, Dale McGee says, games, games, games. There are probably hundreds of games I'd buy if they did a Linux port. In particular, I'd love a good arcade racing game along the lines of Need for Speed. Um, mm. Several other people. Sunshine Bear says he has a, his son or her... I don't know. Sunshine Bear says, my son has a list of games as long as your arms. Plants vs. Aliens or something comes to mind. Jan says, games... <laughs> although this I mean I imagine if we'd asked this question two years ago many more people would have mm. said games but the Steam thing does seem to have reached a, a point I don't think the kind of the number of users for example of Steam and Linux is going up particularly um, but Steam boxes haven't really come no but you know, m- maybe they will on a on a kind of related note I think it's bad that Linux doesn't have kind of uh, any of um vr kind of headset support at the moment so this very week for example last week the first um consumer virtual reality devices have been shipped there the first was the um oculus now owned by facebook um and the htc vive which was partly developed by valve the people behind steam os and neither of them have um linux support they both promised it they both promise it in the future but if you want to, this is a very cutting edge thing. You could use um, the original um, development kits of Oculus on Linux, and lots of people did. Um, but at the moment, if you want to get into not just the gaming side of virtual reality, but start experimenting, it's very limited. And I'm, that's a bit disappointing. I'm surprised and disappointed that Linux APIs haven't been tra- treated as first class citizens like they have with Windows. I suppose it reflects the very cutting edge nature of it, but that's what stopped me kind of. I haven't got the money anyway, but buying into the hardware, and I think it's a really exciting thing that I'm excited about, and there's no Linux support. It's surprising as well with the one that Valve have put a lot of work into. Yeah, yeah. And they have said that it will come, but it's just not, you know, why not do it right at the very beginning? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And also Valve as well has created an API that's called OpenVR, and it's one of those misnomers that it's not open source. It's simply that the API is open and for you to you know link to. It doesn't mean that the code is open source, and that's a missed opportunity too. Because an open source API for virtual reality would be a very good thing. Uh, back to the masses, um, AutoCAD, the f- massively complicated design, three D design software, uh, Garfield Pruin. Sean and Sunshine Bear again uh, would all love to get their hands on AutoCAD on Linux. <laughs> AutoCAD. I mean, there are people who do it. So yeah. For me, um, pretty much everything I want to use runs on Linux in one form or another. But the only non-free software I find myself using. Uh, is is for communication. This yeah, we're doing this on Hangouts, and I would much rather do it on an open platform. But the ones we've tried just haven't worked as well. Um, once you get above more than sort of one to one chatting um, in sort of group uh, video chats, the bandwidth issues with other ones have really caused us problems. Whereas Hangouts seems to work not fantastically, but it's workable. Whereas other ones haven't been. And uh, things like WhatsApp, and I know there are open source alternatives, but this is the case where it, it's not necessarily the software I'm using, but the software that I that people I want to communicate with are using. And uh, at the moment, that's WhatsApp. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so for the most part, I am doing things uh, in Linux, but there's a couple of yeah of chat things I'd rather go open with. Um, Craig has a good one here. Um, He's waiting for a good floss equivalent for Sage accounts and payroll, uh, which he acknowledges Mm. is a long shot because it has to stay up to date with each country's legislation. 
I use Linux at home, and if we could get rid of Sage, I'd move our office to Linux too. We use a lot of Floss software on Windows at the moment, and Frank goes into more detail on this. Um, so the only Windows program that I use regularly, that is annually, is uh, United States Federal and State Income Tax Preparation Software. The tax rules change annually in subtle ways and necessitate annual updates on a rigid schedule by persons with highly specialised legal and accounting knowledge and expertise. I don't expect to see it coming to Linux. No. Yeah, I, I've never known how much of a conspiracy theory this is, but it seems to prop up every time you talk about accounting software that um, the accounting software, the companies that make accounting software in America lobby the government for increasingly complex rules to force people <laughs> to have to update their software and to, yeah. and to stick with them. I, I genuinely don't know if that's true or not. Um, if it is, it's both horrific and quite clever of them. But I can see that being quite a big... Uh, Big issue for free software. And the uh, the Panamanians as well. They're, are presumably, <laughs> they're presumably lobbying for more complicated tax laws. Yeah, but open it in the name of anything and you can't use it in Panama. <laughs> I've got another one actually, a um, small one. I noticed a few people mentioned audio software like FL Fruity Loop Studio. Um, and as great as Arda is, it's not as good, in my opinion, as something as an old version of Cubase for two specific reasons. Um, folders in Cubase and many other uh, digital audio workstations, you've been able to group. So all of the Brad Sucks um, tracks, for example, could go into a single folder and you could manipulate that as a single audio file and then break it out into all the different parts like the vocals and the uh, guitars if you need to. Um, and also, you can edit all of our voices um, across multiple tracks when they're in the same folder, which you can't do with just like a single click in Arda. You can do it by multiply selecting them. Um, and simple usability things like zooming in and zooming out in Arda. There isn't quite the same um, aspect on usability and functionality um, that I'd like to see. Another corner case from Ushki. Uh, I found ways to do pretty much everything in Linux and love it, but I still can't update my Harmony remote or Hobby's Garmin without mm. Windows. The real problem, though, is my sewing pattern creator, which is Pattern Master mm. by Wild Ginger. There is just nothing like it on Linux, and wine is no help. And yeah. further up in the thread, uh, Shadow Firebird says, my other half would like to design cross-stitch patterns, and there is nothing. The best I can find is some excellent picture conversion software. Um... I remember we we looked at a cross stitch thing, bit of software in Fospex, and true to form, uh, Carl Ove Hufthammer says KDE has a cross stitch program called KX Stitch. <laughs> I'm always. Is it a KDE program, or is it just a way of configuring KDE so everything appears in cross stitch? That would be amazing. <laughs> There was a um, there's a free magazine here in that gets handed out in large towns called Stylist, and they had, they had a, a recent cover showing the White House cross stitched, and the even the, I think the typography was all cross stitched, and the the header was um, a woman's places in the White House, and it was so effective, and it just looked exactly like one of those um, well like a cross stitched something that people would make in the olden days or well, even in the olden days nowadays but just the the mixture of the the medium and the message was i don't know was very very cool but cross stitch it always fascinates me what i think is just a you know niche ways of spending people's time that that uh, that just ends up in is free software because you know everybody's operating their in their own little niche and it's it's just amazing I find it really fascinating. <laughs> cross stitch isn't actually that well, no, niche. I know it? it's not. I know it's it's huge, but it it has never entered my consciousness as something that I would like to try. And then, I'm sure there's a lot more cross stitches than there are Linux well, users. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, probably. But that's cross that's stitch the, has got to be easier than Python. But that's what makes it easy. That's what makes it interesting to me. It's the the yeah. disparity between the real life of there being millions of people who like to cross stitch and the, the lack of anything cross stitchy in my head. 
Like what? Yeah. What am I missing? Am I wrong? <laughs> anyway, that's it from the masses. Uh, there's lots and lots of um, n- actually not not too many responses on on the website because we only put it up very late. But AutoCAD, um, iTunes, Canon printers, uh, Train Simulator 2016. <laughs> Can we have Truck Simulator as well? I really want to try that. I, I've i never played either one. I'm, the, just the name of it puts me off intently. That's the whole point. I have no the whole idea point. if they're any good. You just get home, you pour yourself a glass of wine, and you drive from New York to Las Vegas <laughs> to deliver, you but, know, steel. <laughs> but why? <laughs> why? <laughs> It's relaxing. You're putting miles under the wheels. You can I, listen uh, to listen to the Eagles. I drove on the dual carriageway for the first time. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm learning to drive at the moment, and uh, yeah, that was yesterday's well lesson. How did it go? It was less. It was less exciting than I expected. Did everybody overtake you, even though you were doing the speed limit? <laughs> no, I wasn't even doing the speed. It's a dual carriageway in Bristol. Oh, <laughs> I was yeah, lucky yeah. to be doing double digits. <laughs> <laughs> but I can tell you, I definitely didn't get home and say, wow, I want to do that on the computer game for five hours. It's, you it's so myself, relaxing. You wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I want a VR headset to be able to play Truck Simulator. <laughs> It's been done. It's been done. <laughs> that doesn't mean it should be. <laughs> <laughs> With great power comes great responsibility. Right, that's it, isn't that's it? That's it. So uh, we we promise, kind of, that we'll try and get back to our two-week schedule as it's been three weeks um, for the next episode, um, which will be after our next deadline. And so... We'll speak to you all then. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.